Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar titled Deploying Machine Learning Techniques at Petabyte Scale with Databricks featuring uh, DataZoo. My name is Wayne Chan. I'll be your moderator for today. Before we get started with today's presentation, just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items to ensure we have the best possible experience. Um, first, your, all your connections will be muted uh, today. So if you do have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A panel within your Bright Talk UI. Uh, and we're actually going to address questions as they come through periodically. So uh, you know, feel free to ask, uh, ask any questions you have, and the, uh, the data to team will address them as they come in. And uh, we will also have uh, a Q&A session at the end for any outstanding questions. And any questions that we don't get to, we'll answer uh, within the Databricks forum uh, within a day or two after the webinar. This webinar also will be recorded. Um, so if you want to share it with your colleagues, uh, you can access the recording from the Databricks website um, by tomorrow. Uh, you can share that link with your colleagues, as well as the uh, a PDF version of this, this uh, presentation deck it will also be available. So I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our speakers today. We have several members uh, of the data, to, uh, data Science and Engineering team. We have Dr. Saket Mengel, Senior Principal Data Scientist from DataZoo, Maximo Germendez, Lead Engineer, and Dr. Sunanda Parthasarathy, Data Scientist from DataZoo. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Saket, to take it away. Uh, thanks, Sarin. So let me talk about what we are going to cover during this session. Uh, we are going to talk about what DataZoo does, uh, what field we work in, and also define the problem statement for why we need to use a petabyte-sized machine learning uh, system. I'm going to talk about how we leverage Apache Spark and Databricks to build a system. Uh, later on, the more interesting part probably for you guys would be Maximo will be presenting a live demo of the code that we use for implementing the machine learning system. And he will also discuss different challenges he faced when we were building this uh, huge data machine learning system. And then Sunanda is going to talk about how we use the data that we store using Spark in Spark. And we use that data for analytics. So we have a uniform platform for both research and development, for engineering, as well as for analytics. So DataZoo works in this domain, which is called as real-time bidding. Our business is to buy advertisements or ad impressions online for thousands of different advertisers. And we are a B2B company, so most of our clients are businesses. But I'm pretty sure that most of the people who are here online, you all have experienced our software in one way or another during uh, the last few years. So let me talk about how real-time bidding actually works. So as a consumer, when you go on any web page, let's say you go on CNN.com, you get to see an ad right at the top of the page or around different pages. The way, there's a lot of science that goes behind what ad is exactly served to you at a given time. So what happens is as soon as you load the web page, the, web, the website uh, calls an ad exchange which is for to provide an ad to it. So what an ad exchange does is it just looks at the website and gives it what ad, ad needs to be shown at a particular location. The ad exchange in turn is going to send out a bid request, which is a request like eBay saying that this ad slot is available to buy. Who wants to buy it and what price are you willing to pay for it? So it goes into an auction where many companies like DataZoo look at the ad slot. They look at the user who is on CNN.com and they try to guess which of what product is this user most likely to react to at a given time. So the ad request goes from the ad exchange to companies like DataZoo, and that's where our machine learning algorithms kick in. So what our machine learning algorithms are supposed to do is based on the thousands of advertisers that we represent, we try to find the advertiser who the customer is going to react positively to, and we also have to define how much money we are willing to pay for an ad slot. Remember I said that this process works like eBay, it's an auction. So many companies bid for the ad slot, saying that, okay, I'll bid $1 for the ad slot. Someone says I'll bid $5 and so on. And at the end, the ad exchange gets all these bids and selects the winner based on the company that's willing to pay the most for the ad slot. 
and accordingly they sell the ad slot at a second price option which means that the highest bidder gets to show an ad but only pays what the second highest bidder uh, has uh, bid on that particular ad slot and eventually the customer gets to see the ad from the winning company who won the ad auction so there's a lot of work that's being done on the back end for a ad to come to you on a given website but you don't see that right because when you load a page the ad appears there instantaneously and this makes the problem very difficult where our machine learning algorithms only have around 20 milliseconds to react to a given bid request and send a bid response to it and it has to keep on doing this multiple times so let me talk about exactly what is done by data zoom so data zoom is a company that was spun out of mit labs most of the algorithms that are used in data zoo on the back end were once used for uh, used by nasa to send the mission to mars the pathfinder mission to mars and we use similar algorithms in data zoo to solve the problem of advertising uh, it's one of the fastest growing companies uh, according to inc inc 5000 and let me give you some quick statistics about why we need a petabyte scale system and we use we have to use machine learning for that So as I explained in the previous slide, we talked about how one bid request is being resolved by data zoo. But we are serving ads across hundreds of countries, across five different continents. So we are getting bid requests, multiple bid requests at the same time. So data zoo currently answers around 2 million bid requests every second. So just think about it. We are making two uh, we are answering 2 million bid requests every second. and for every bid request we are running machine learning models for more than 1000 advertisers to select which advertiser would the rea user react best to so there is a lot of computation being done on the back end at data zoo's end every second to do that now this generates a lot of data we serve billions of impressions every month and also we respond to a lot of bid requests so more than billion bid requests every every month right uh the response time as i said is around 10 milliseconds round trip so the machine learning algorithm gets less than that to make a decision for every bid request so because of this huge scale of data we generate a lot of logs in data zoom we generate around 130 terabytes of logs per day and every day when we train our machine learning algorithms we have two petabytes of data that we sift through to create machine learning algorithms for different advertisers So let me talk about how the data zoo machine learning algorithm work. What what are we exactly trying to learn and predict? So what data zoo does is we serve ad impressions, right? We participate in the real time bidding auctions and we so we buy ad impressions for the advertisers. But after we buy the ad impressions, we place a cookie on every user's web browser. Now if that user shows a positive intent towards the advertiser, for example, if we show an ad for let's say McDonald's and then the user goes to the mcdonald's website and does a action or browses the website now that's a positive intent according to us uh, similarly if a person clicks on the ad or actually goes to visit the ad or if you are on youtube and we you actually watch the entire ad all these things are considered positive intents and data zoo is tracking all these actions too so what we do is we run a view join between the ad impressions that we are serving which is billions of impressions and these positive signals that we are gathering from the market to know which impressions led to a positive intent and which impressions did not lead to a positive intent now based on this data we create a large machine learning data set which is again as i said it's it's petabytes in size and it's a normal machine learning data set where we have different features we know about a user uh, like demographic features or what location they are using the internet from and so on and we also know what advertisers are serving ads of uh, which advertisers we are representing so we know the verticals for the advertisers and so on we also know which web pages we are representing an ad so we know that uh, cnn.com may generate more actions for certain advertisers but espn.com may generate more actions for different kind of advertisers so we use all these attributes and we train machine learning algorithms using those attributes to predict a positive signal in the market based on what advertiser defines as a positive signal now training the model is not enough for us because machine uh, machine learning models can be good or they are not as predictive enough right so we uh, get after we train our machine learning models 
we make them go through two different phases. The first is the evaluation phase. Like any machine learning algorithm, we have a holdout data set and we evaluate the models we train using the whole held out data set and evaluate the accuracy of prediction from that machine learning model. Now if the model is good, then we will ship the model to our real-time bidding system which is then used for buying impressions. The second important step is you can't just say as give an exchange of uh, probability, right? You can't say that I think that this person is 70% probable of buying a certain product and the exchange wants a dollar value for every bid request that it's sending. And this dollar value is important because you don't want to bid too high, else you are overpaying for a given ad. But if you bid too low, you will lose an ad auction. So we calibrate our machine learning models to translate these probabilities into dollar values such that it's most efficient in the market. Now once the models are created and the calibration is generated, these models are then shipped to our S3 buckets and then the real-time bidding system picks these models from the S3 bucket and uses them for buying more impressions, which again goes back into the loop where we generate more impressions and the next day we again train more models and buy more impressions and then that just keeps on going. So what makes this problem hard? Like the first thing of course we are thinking is we have two petabytes of data that we want to process, but now due to cloud computing and technologies like Apache Spark, this data set is manageable. We can actually use such a large data set to create machine learning models. The second thing is the models that we are generating have to react to a build request really quickly. We don't have a lot of time to uh, make a decision. So we need a system where after we train the models, those models can make decisions within a fraction of milliseconds so that we can run 1,000 models at the same time on the same build request and then pick the best advertisers out of them. Thirdly, we have a system that runs across uh, five different continents and uh, you don't stop seeing ads online, right? And so we can't stop training our algorithms too. So we have to ship these models 24-7 continuously based on the new evidence that we are getting from the market. So that leads to training thousands and thousands of machine learning models every day from this two petabyte of data. The second most important thing for us is because this model have to be refreshed regularly, we can't have a system where we just run a notebook and then that notebook creates the models and then we ship the models, right? We need to have code that is very stable where once we deploy the system, it automatically keeps on running and keeps this loop alive for serving more impressions to then gather more data and then training the models to serve more impressions. So we need to design an unattended operation where the system is very stable. So stability and quality of our algorithms are very important to us. And thirdly, the in, we work in a ad auction environment. So Datazoo is not the only company who is going to participate in these ad auctions. So we take it very seriously to make sure that our algorithms are state of the art and they are better than anyone else in terms of accuracy as well as efficiency. So we need to adapt to the market quickly where as soon as we see some inefficiencies, we need to um, make our models aware of it and change our machine learning models regularly. So let me explain about why we uh, uh, started looking at using Apache Spark to solve this problem. So first of all, the most important thing that attracted us to Apache Spark was its support for MLlib. Spark is known for handling a large amount of data, but because it also supports MLlib, the machine learning library in Spark, it's very easy for us to develop new algorithms and then use that data to and use those algorithms to uh, find more predictive patterns. For example, some uh, advertisers, a model, a model A might work well. For example, for some advertisers, random forest might be the best algorithm, but for other, SVM might be the best algorithm. So we need to have a system which will train a lot of different algorithms and then we can select the model that's most predictive. And before, like Datazoo has been in this business for more than seven years now. And when we designed our system previously, there was no good machine open source uh, uh, software that were available for this problem. So everything was written in-house. So whenever we had to add a new algorithm, we had to go through the whole process of actually coding a new algorithm, making sure that, it, that it's efficient enough for a map reduce then making sure that we can write enough uh, fail safes or unit tests around it to, so that they, we don't get any wrong decisions or the algorithm is implemented correctly. 
But what Spark allows us to do is use a open source library which is very well known and has been used by a lot of researchers. So we are pretty confident about the quality of the algorithms that we are shipping. Secondly, what we found was that uh, the Spark um, our system that we generated was faster than the MapReduce system or the Hadoop system that we are using currently for training and testing the models. Now this is very important for us because one of the big costs for DataZoo is maintaining these large stacks of machines and if it's faster then we can reduce our stack cost and make it more affordable. Thirdly, now we can actually use iterative models because Spark is an in-memory algorithm it actually has a good support for in iterative models that were not available for Hadoop. And finally, as I said, that we work in an elastic cloud environment, and Spark is one of the best fits for that because it was designed for that purpose. So now what we're going to do is Maximo is going to present a demo of the code that we actually used uh, for to train the system and also talk about different challenges that we face during this issue. So Maximo, you can take it on from here. Thank you, Sadiq. Thank you, Saket. Um, so do you see my screen? I'm turning it on. Perfect. I think everyone sees my screen. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, um, a, a notebook over here that kind of goes through in a nutshell, the process that we go from, from research to deployment to production of these models in a simplistic way, of course, to make this uh, uh, webinar fun. Um, so say a data scientist wants to improve uh, the model for an advertiser or, or, or maybe a very specific scenario that wants to be improved. Um, so we collect some data. Um, and uh, for example, here we, we'll just collect the data we have for training and for testing, which is previously split on S3. Uh, these are the data bricks mounts that are very useful for us. Um, so we will just create data frames, data sets in this case, um, to read the testing and training data from, from S3. We typically want to give the, the oh wait, let, let me run the notebook so that you believe me all this works. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna run all, all steps in the notebook and I'm gonna uh, walk you through the notebook as it runs. So we have uh, a testing and training data set um, in, in, uh, in our Databricks notebook. We're going to give it a name to learning events to the training data set. It's very convenient. And we're going to register a few uh, UDFs. Here we, we attach previously a jar that we have um, our code, and so we can register new UDFs or user-defined functions that we're going to use for, for SQL analysis and transformations, yeah, as you'll see. So uh, the first thing we'll probably do is explore a little bit the data set that we have in hand at, at hand. And what is the purpose of, of the machine learning algorithms, as uh, Sackett was, expl was uh, explaining previously, is to detect which of the ad opportunities that, that we receive will result in a positive action. Um, and, and even when we, when we win some of this bid request and really show an ad or an impression, only a few of those impressions uh, after shown to the user will, uh, will be a positive, what we call a positive, which means that the user somehow reacted to that to that ad either either it, that the user bought a product or the user clicked on an ad or the user uh, filled a survey or what, whatever it means for the advertiser to to uh, tag an impression as a positive or, or an attribution as we call it so we have impressions and attributions we have a bunch of impressions and attributions that we want to detect the patterns for those attributions are the ones that we're mostly interested. Suppose we want to simplify the problem. We, we deal with hundreds of features, but uh, suppose we, we uh, want to simplify the, the problem and choose just three features that will allow us to predict whether a particular bit opportunity will be just an impression or actually an attribution, that is, a positive action, a positive following action. And we're going to choose the operating system that the user has, uh, the, the site where the user is, is navigating, either in you know, the desktop or mobile device or wherever. And then the user local hour uh, um, of that particular bit opportunity. Um, so once we have the SQL, uh, we can do a lot of uh, data preparation, the typical things that one would, would uh, go through while 
trying to determine the right transformations for the data set to be submitted to the machine learning pipelines. In particular, one, one, tri one trivial thing that one wants to do is detect well, how, how imbalanced our data set is. And as you can see here in the, in, in the chart, uh, in, this, in this particular data set, uh, the, the, uh, the data set is pretty imbalanced. And that's almost always the case in, in our business. Um, so, okay, we have some idea of, of our data set. The data set is supposed is cleaned enough and uh, we want to go and create a machine learning pipeline capable of making predictions on whether users will actually perform positive actions on those impressions or just leave it at there. Um, so, we're going to build a pipeline to construct a model and uh, we're going to use Spark the standard way here. It, there's nothing new uh, uh, from, from, from DataZoo other than the definition of the UDFs over here in this SQL Transformer that I'm going to show in a second. But basically, what we want to do is we want to take these three features and create a, a, uh, an algorithm capable of predicting the, the result, whether it will be an impression or an attribution. And in this particular case, we're going to first start with a SQL. We're going to build a pipeline, a standard MLlib pipeline. The first step is going to be a SQL transformation. Uh, in this particular case, we're, look how we're using uh, the UDFs again in the SQL transformation in the pipeline to do feature engineering. We use a lot of UDFs for, for, uh, for um, feature engineering, which is pretty handy. So the first thing we'll select just uh, the fields or the, the features that we were interested in for learning as a SQL transformer. Then we're going to apply uh, what we call a top K estimator, which is basically a string, string indexer to transform these categorical features into numerical features, which is a requirement for most of the MLlib um, algorithms. In this particular case, we're going to use a, a random forest. And uh, we're going to assemble the features in a vector assemble stage before submitting it to the random forest. So we have the SQL transformer as the first stage. Then we're going to map. Then we're going to index all of the all of our features using the top K estimator or the st string indexer. And then we're going to assemble all the um, features in a vector, which can be submitted to the random forest estimator to create a model. So look at uh, at, at this. Over here, I'm showing the result of applying the machine learning algorithm to the testing data set. On the, on the left hand side, we can see that the, the data frame shows the three original uh, features that we, that we chose. In the middle, we see the indexed version of the features, that is the, the numerical representation. We can see then the assembling of the features in a, in a vector, in this features uh, column. And then we get the predictions of the model, as well as the probability. Um, so that's that's our transformed uh, data set. Typically, one would want to validate if this model is, is sound, and that we, we run uh, uh, the standard Spark binary classification evaluator, and we check that the area under the ROC curve is 0.66, which might not be the best model, uh, but it's better than random. And assuming that's good enough uh, for this really uh, hard challenge, uh, then we're going to just uh, say that we're going to we want to ship this model to production. So okay, so how how do we ship this model to production? One of the problems we've encountered, and many many people have encountered this problem too in in, in Spark, is that MLlibs uh, uh, models are capable of providing uh, predictions uh, for every row in a in a data set, but you need to submit a whole data a whole data set or a whole data frame. Uh, there's no out-of-the-box algorithm right now in, in, Spark, in Apache Spark that uh, would create a model that can respond to predictions on a row-by-row -row or a per-request basis. And that's exactly our scenario while bidding. So we receive bid requests, and in a flash of a second, we need to uh, determine whether that bid opportunity uh, is, is good or, or not. And we're going to decide how much to bid on that on that opportunity. And they come in, you know, in, in in rows, so to speak, or they come in batches, or they come, you know, per request. They don't come in a data set, right? So we need to respond 
uh, immediately given a row, we need to uh, provide a prediction instantly. So uh, there are other other um, ways to, to deal with this problem. There's a new project called DBML Local, which was presented in, in, in Databricks webinar, uh, I think a few months ago, which is um, which is uh, very nice, and we will probably evaluate it in the future. But we started this early, early on, and uh, at that time we didn't have uh, such thing as the uh, DBML local. So we built our own infrastructure to uh, deal with this problem of being able to provide predictions uh, in a live setting with minimal Spark setup. We cannot create Spark context. We cannot. We need to be. We need to work in a very lightweight uh, environment. And, and we created all this framework. Basically, we created wrapper classes around Spark that will create models based on the stages that are defined in the pipeline. Um, you can see, in this case, how we define this production pipeline. It's called the Spark Pipeline Builder. We, we use the Builder pattern here to, to ease the definition of a pipeline. But you can notice that these are the exact same stages that we define with the standard Spark. But we wrap them up in a builder, and we wrap them up in our own classes, so that we are able to uh, provide a model that is not only capable of providing predictions given an entire data set, but, for, but capable of providing predictions given a, a, a one by one row. And we're gonna, you can see that the, the stages map exactly to the to the ones you, you would define with Spark out of the box, and this is really important because. This makes it easy to go from research to, to, to production. We just need to you know, port the same transformations, the same stages that we used while prototyping, apply them here in a pipeline builder, and now we have our model that is shippable to these thousands of machines that are bidding 24-7 uh, on behalf of our, of our advertisers. So we're going to define the same stages. We're going to fit the pipeline create a model, and we're going to save this model much like the, the, the Spark saves the model. That is, we call it a, a data frame model, uh, which we will use for evaluation. For evaluation, we'll just up use the model as Spark provides. But for bidding, we're going to save a different kind of model, which we call a row model, which is capable of providing these predictions uh, at a row by row basis. So that's why we save into S3. In this particular notebook, I just save it locally. But in real life, we save, we save on S3 two different models, the typical Spark model and the raw model that we use live. So uh, I'm just going to show you that while creating the, the while saving the models, is saving a raw model and a data set model. And uh, this data set model is saved using standard uh, Java serialization. It's not our, our best pick for serialization, but it's the one that, that works out of the box. Um, while creating this role model, we had to re-implement some of the stages. Uh, for example, we had to implement a SQL uh, engine capable of resolving select statements live at bid time and also doing the UDF transformation. But in all of the other cases, uh, the all, all the other transformations, especially the machine learning algorithm, we didn't have to re-implement you know, the, the, the algorithm. We just had to delegate to the right Spark existing class. So it wasn't a huge effort. OK, so now we, ha we have serialized this model in S3. Uh, and we want to now simulate what will happen live. Right? We're going to ship this, this model to production. And thousands of machines are going to start using this, this model for making live predictions. So we're going to deserialize this model live. And we're going to simulate what will happen at live. So to, to do that simulation, what we're going to do is we're going to load in memory 100,000 rows, or assuming they are bid requests, uh, from our testing data set and load them completely in memory. Then we're going to apply for each of these rows the machine learning algorithm. And we're going to time the amount of time it took for this, for this model to run. And uh, so that's what happened here. Uh, we're going to register the UEF. We're going to take 100,000 samples from our testing data set. We're going to load them all in memory. And we're going to run the row model transformations. It's for each row, we're going to apply, and we're going to get the probability of this uh, row being an impression or an attribution. 
And as you can see, after looping through all of the uh, predictions, each prediction took 0.13 milliseconds to, to run. That's well uh, uh, beyond our, our time requirements, so it's definitely suitable for real-time binning. And we, this, this means that this particular algorithm, since we have a few milliseconds for each, for each prediction, 0.13 milliseconds uh, for each prediction is, is more than more than enough uh, for our for our requirements. And and uh, this is this is the end of the demo. I will go uh, and show you some some more slides. Um, seconds. Uh, regarding the benchmarks. Okay. So w one of the requirements uh, we had for uh, going from our Hadoop-based uh, machine learning algorithms to a Spark-based learning is learning algorithms is are they do they scale linearly with time? Meaning, as we increase the number of training records, will the time it takes for train for training uh, increase linearly as well? And our experiments show that that is the case for for most of the algorithms that uh, that we currently use. And uh, that, that was a very important thing uh, because we want to, uh, as Sackett was mentioning, we want to keep the stacks uh, uh, cost efficient. And uh, the other thing that we're interested in, uh, in, in evaluating is the latency of our models. We showed in the demo that you know we can we can build um, models that are capable of providing sub second, sub millisecond uh, predictions, and we evaluate our our Hadoop based. Uh, models are really a little bit faster than, say, uh, a random forest, a Spark random forest. But uh, there are other Spark algorithms that take just about the same time. So it's comparable in terms of, of latency. Once we add more features and more transformations, obviously the, the algorithms get slower, but it's still within the time frame that we have for, for bidding. And uh, the, other, the, the other important thing is that the, the, the models they are deserializing memory on our beta machines, so we need to make sure that these models don't occupy uh, too much memory. We can't obviously uh, use disk at, at bit, bit time because that would be too slow. We need to load them completely in memory and just provide predictions uh, by loading them from memory. Um, you can see obviously random forest or as you increase the size of the of the models, you're going to have uh, more ex more uh, Ex expensive uh, models memory and uh, some some other algorithms like logistic regression might be more lightweight but they're still within within the the bounds that that uh, that we need in data so so good news we uh, we are now working we are now shipping uh, Apache spark models to production we're using them live we still use uh, our Hadoop based models for some uh, campaigns but we are we are shipping more and more uh, Apache Spark models versus the Hadoop-based models uh, every day, so we'll continue on that track. And and with this, um, I want to introduce uh, Sananda, who's going to talk about the um, analytics aspects of uh, our, our our platform. Sounds good. So, Maximo, before uh, Sananda, let me just answer some of the questions about our machine learning system that we have been getting in the chat window, and very interesting questions. So the first question was, what are the features that we learn from? What are the different features? I won't go into details because some of the features are proprietary to data zoo. But uh, I can say that like we generally learn from three different classes of features. One is the creative, that is the advertiser-based feature, like what kind of ad is being shown to the user, what's the color of the ad, and so on. The second is the customer, like different demographics data about the customers or the location data about customers. And the third is the context in which that is shown, which is the website or different like category of website and so on, and those kind of features we use uh, in our system. The second group of questions that I had was basically, uh, how do we automatically monitor if the model degrades throughout the system or how do we manage that? And why would a machine learning algorithm change every day? So note that the uh, domain that we are working on is marketing, right? And marketing works based on different events or milestones in the year. 
for example, like if there's Valentine's Day, and if I'm running a campaign about people buying chocolates or flowers, immediately on 15th of February, the buying behavior of the user changes drastically from people who are buying flowers or chocolates on 14th of February. So we need to have a machine learning model that can adapt pretty quickly to these events. And in case the market changes drastically, we need to have a model that automatically learns from it. So that's why we have to train the model every day to make sure that we keep updated based on the events in the market. And secondly, we monitor our models based on the prediction capabilities. So we use different evaluation metrics like uh, uh, ROC area or accuracy. And if the model uh, satisfies certain accuracy criteria, only then they are shipped to the production, else we ship a generic classifier to the production. Thirdly, how do we uh, tackle the problem of imbalanced data? Because as Maximo showed, that almost like in most of the cases, like 90 to 99% of the data set is negative, and only 1% to 10% data set is positive. And we tackle that using different techniques. We use techniques where there are positives, and then you also define some impressions as half positive based on if a person showed an intent but did not perform an action. We also use uh, techniques like negative sampling to downsample the size of negative data set in order to uh, handle the uh, imbalanced nature of data. So nothing like special, but most of the work is being done using like research that is already out there to handle imbalanced data. All right, having said that, I'll hand it over to Sunanda, who's going to talk about the analytics aspect. Thanks, Aket and Maximo. So uh, we want to change gears a little bit here and talk about the other big element that happens at DataZoo, which is uh, advanced analytics. And um, we thought this would be very relevant to this presentation because what we found at DataZoo is using Spark and Databricks as a common platform for both advanced analytics and machine learning engineering we are able to quickly go through the R&D pipeline and uh, go to the release of a product. So I want to um, switch gears, as I mentioned, and talk about what exactly we do in advanced analytics and why we chose Apache Spark as one of our primary tools. So you have heard until now a good deal about our real-time bidding engine, which is our core platform. and. As Sarkis and Maximo were mentioning, we get petabyte scale of data through this every day. And our algorithm marketplace chooses the right algorithm, optimizes the best way for every single advertising campaign for every single client. So as you can imagine, with all this client data that is going through our system, the clients have very business-oriented, marketing, industry-oriented questions. Examples would be, how do I distribute my marketing budget based on the performance of the campaigns that you guys optimized? For example, let's take a client A who has, um, for whom we have run a display campaign, meaning we have bid on ads that are shown on a desktop, and we have also run a mobile campaign, meaning we bid on bid requests that came for a mobile phone. And this is for the same client, and our algorithms performed to their best, and it so happens that the mobile campaign performs better than the display campaign. So obviously the client would like to know why that is. Is it a property of their consumers? Is it some kind of customer segmentation that is leading to this performance? Is it something inherent to their advertising uh, creatives and all the other advertising features that they have attached to a mobile creative versus a display creative? And based on this performance, they would also like to take the insights and adjust their marketing budget for the next quarter so that we can continue to optimize and give them the maximum return on investment. So these kind of questions, as you can imagine, sometimes needs historical data analysis, sometimes needs further predictive modeling, and sometimes we need to import other third-party data or first-party client data and combine it with the data that is going through our system to generate these insights. So we decided to use Apache Spark to build these um, to build these models that forms our analytics engine. And uh, one of the re few of the reasons why we did this was one is it's central. Both the machine learning engineering team and our team can take advantage of it. The other is it makes advanced analytics a reality. Right, the speed with which you can do some queries. And you can do things like graph processing, which is a very relevant field for advertising because 
we are continuously building device and ID graphs for every consumer at very large scales, and Spark can do that at scale and at speed. Uh, we can do streaming analytics, real-time streaming analytics, and Spark is definitely one of the um, upcoming platforms and frameworks to do this very quickly. The other key advantage for us as an advanced analytics team is it Spark speaks multiple languages. A typical advanced analytics team, you can imagine, is made up of many different uh, portfolio of people. There are data analysts, there are data science engineers, there are, there are scientists, there are consultants. And we needed something that, uh, and each person comes with their own uh, preferred and optimized language. So we wanted a framework that would be easy for people to adapt based on whichever language they use, and Spark does that very easily. And furthermore, Databricks does it, it makes it even more easy by having these notebooks where we can quickly change the languages in which we are coding. And um, another typical aspect of any advanced analytics group is we like to be a little bit one layer separated away from all the complexities of the actual data pipeline complexity. The typical Hadoop uh, jobs, you can imagine if you wanted to do very fast advanced analytics, you will have to write very heavy Java queries. And that requires a certain level of expertise, which an advanced analytics member might not have. But here it becomes easy. A person who knows even just SQL can quickly jump into Spark and take advantage of the parallelization that Spark gives to run their queries. To us, that has reduced the time it takes us for, uh, from a conception of an idea to a release of product from few months to few weeks, actually. And this, in uh, essence, accelerates the analyst or data scientist work. So we are quickly able to listen to the feedback in the market, come up with an idea for a product, prototype it using Databricks notebooks, and I'll show you a quick demo of that. And then we are able to quickly push it to uh, production, give it to the engineering team, who then makes it work as a full product. So let me talk a little bit about how we build this uh, workflow for advanced analytics using Spark and Databricks. As we mentioned before, there's the real-time bidding engine through which petabyte uh, scale data comes through every single day. And this gets stored in S3. Depending on the problem at hand, we might want to onboard partner or client data which we also bring to S3. So S3 is our common location where we maintain all our data. We then um, use the data sitting in S3, do our predictive modeling and analytical models using Spark and Databricks, and that I call as the analytics engine. And then we spit out the results of this back to S3. And now it is available for dashboarding or reporting in the true BI sense or it can be available for uh, Maximo and Sarkate's team to further optimize their algorithms based on the insights we got from historical performance, for example. So a combination of Databricks and Spark has um, worked out very well for us in streamlining this workflow and getting quickly to the results we want. So having said that, let me quickly jump into a, a demo. where I'm going to walk you through a Databricks notebook, which many of you are familiar with, I would assume. So uh, this is a typical project uh, where you can see collaboration, heavy collaboration between advanced analytics teams and data science engineering teams. And this is called multi-touch attribution to give you a very brief overview of what we are trying to solve for here. In advertising, as consumers of advertisements, we look at ads across multiple media touch points. We look at advertisements on our mobile phone, on our desktop, on our office computer, home computer, on TV. And after consuming media across all these touch points, we may or may not buy a product influenced or may not be influenced by the advertising. And um, for advertisers, from the client perspective, they would really like to understand which of the adver advertisements you saw actually made you go and buy their product, because that determines what, uh, how they allocate marketing investment and how they change their portfolio of investment. So for them, that is very important. And traditionally, uh, the industry has been looking at this problem at, with a very simplistic view, mainly because of lack of big data tools initially, but now things are developing. They used to give all the credit for the 
product that you purchased, let's take Amazon as an example. Let's say you bought a product on Amazon. And if you saw an ad just before purchasing it, whether or not you actually saw it and were influenced by it, they will give all the credit to that last ad. This is called last touch attribution. Attribution being that particular conversion or that positive signal that Maximo was talking about is attributed to that particular advertisement. But as common sense tells you, we consume media across multiple touch points, so we should be having some kind of a model that will give the right credit to every touch point that can somehow understand how it, each advertisement influenced you in buying or not buying the product. Right? So this pie chart here uh, shows you that in reality 75% of consumer journeys are multi-touch point journeys. And so you definitely do want to create a model that is not too complex but that is also not too simplistic like, like the last touch which we know is clearly wrong. And uh, this is a notebook which is going to build that model. We have built all the pipeline and stored it in a separate notebook. We call functions from it. We look at the insights and then uh, we turn it over into a BI dashboard uh, insights report that the clients can actually see. So here is a typical notebook. We have um, the import all the packages we need. We run this uh, function for MTA demo, which is like a pipeline that we built in a notebook which has a whole bunch of function definitions that we need. We set the path names and variable names. We read in the data. As you can see here, the data is very uh, messy. For every user, we get all kinds of information, all non-PII, of course, uh, in terms of where they saw the ad, at what time they saw the ad, what was the operating system, so on and so forth. So as any typical data analyst or scientist does, we pass it into usable format. We have a bunch of functions that do it. And now it looks much cleaner. So for every user, user zero here, for example, we collect all the information we have about what ads that, that users saw. So then we split it into what's called conversion trails and non-conversion trails. By conversion trails, we mean uh, all the actions that led to a positive signal or a conversion, meaning the user actually bought something or clicked on the ad or filled out a survey, as Maximo was saying, whatever the advertiser thinks is a positive signal. Non-conversion is where you, a user sees multiple ads but does not act on any of the ads. As, as a first step, we always like to understand our data. So in Databricks, it's very easy to quickly do some descriptive stats. And here, the bar chart you see is between conversion and non-conversion trails. This looks very similar to what Maximo was presenting, which is a heavy negative signal data. And this is very typical for our industry. We always see a very 1% positive signal. Then we like to pare down the data. I've given you a sample of a function that we uh, typically use. And the pipeline that I was talking to you about looks like this with multiple functions. We have pared it down just to whether it is um, a field that tells us whether it's an impression or a conversion, how much was spent on that impression, what device uh, or channel it actually was um, shown in. So we pad it down, and we now just have these three columns. We again do some standard analytics, which is super easy in Databricks. Here we are looking at the total amount spent in display versus mobile. This is going to be relevant for us because our model will have to account for the fact that it is more uh, display-oriented campaign. So, and then we here, right here, run model. We actually run the get multi and last touch model, which is a simple function that we create. It's an in-house built proprietary model where we take conversion rate into effect for figuring out whether an impression had an effect on a conversion or not. Awesome. I think your screen is frozen. I'm just going to switch to the slides and back to the screen share. Okay. Can you just like stop sharing and then share again? No, there doesn't seem to have any effect. You can speak up. Okay. Uh, sorry, it looks like we are having some technical difficulties. I'm going to continue walking through the um, notebook, hoping that it will catch up to the lag at some point. Uh, so feel free to ask questions if, you, if something is not clear in this. Um, so then we also look at percentage change in actions between last touch and multi-touch, because obviously why are we building this multi-touch model so that there is some we want to see a difference between assigning all the credit to the last media touch point. 
So here is an example of a campaign where actually mobile did worse compared to display, right? So this may or may not be good, and we have to think about why that is so. So one of the typical things we do is we have a lever that will change the gran granularity of um, uh, granularity at which the model can be applied. So in this case, mobile is unexpected for this client. So I'm looking into what does it mean? What are the sites in which they have seen the ads? So right now I include another feature, which is site name. And I again do the same process. I um, can do split it into conversion and non-conversion run the analysis and spit out the results to S3, right? So now uh, with Databricks, actually I can also do this really cool stuff where I can create a dashboard that summarizes all the findings that I've done across multiple campaigns. So for example, this is a dashboard I built. And I see that, OK, this campaign is heavily display. Um, spend is heavily focused on display. It has, but multi-touch actually makes mobile perform worse. So then I decided, decide, okay, this uh, that, this particular chart is good, that is not good. I, I do all my initial uh, curation of how my BI dashboarding report should look like right here, which makes it very convenient. And then since all the data is already in S3, all I need to do is then refresh my BI tool, which is a proprietary in-house BI tool we have, which points to that S3 bucket. And boom, your actual chart is populated with the right model, with the right data set, with the, at the right level of granularity. So this, in short, is how we typically move from a, um, we move from creating R&D pipelines in Databricks and Apache Spark and move on to releasing it as a product. And this, as I mentioned, this makes collaboration ex extremely easy because now the results that I spit out can actually use, be used by Maximo and Sarkade's team to optimize on which channel performs better. So now they can actually, if mobile performs worse, they will use that insight to do active analytics. And the next time their algorithm runs a bid, they will actually bid higher for a display ad versus a mobile ad, right? So this changes the realm from advanced analytics to active advanced analytics. And we can easily collaborate using Databricks and Spark. So that was the demo. And uh, we, with that, we would like to thank you for your attention and yeah, take question. some questions. Yeah. Yes. Sounds good. So we have some questions, really interesting questions from the chat. So please continue adding questions um, uh, as we go along. So the first question that uh, was here was, OK, so uh, the machine learning model, as I said before, uh, keeps on changing based on the time of the year or different events that are happening. So how do we make sure that the training model is accurate? So we thought of this problem before. So what we do is before we ship any machine learning model, we always use it, use that model on a small holdout data set that is generated in the most recent amount of time and then use uh, run our model on that data set. So if the model is not able to predict the positive intent, in the holdout data set, then instead of shipping a model that is not good, we generally end up shipping a generic model for that. The second question, I think, was about uh, the data set being imbalanced. So uh, as I said before, that we use a lot of different techniques to tackle this issue because it's the nature of our domain that not a lot of people actually show a positive intent as soon as they see an ad. The rate, let's say, is like one out of every 10,000 person shows a positive intent. And if using machine learning, we can make two out of every 10,000 person show positive intent, you're automatically doubling the value of advertising, right? So uh, what we're doing is we are, uh, work in a, data, uh, in a field where the data set is imbalanced. And using techniques like stratifi stratification or negative sampling, we can tackle the issue of negatively balanced data. Uh, there are some questions for Maximo. So Maximo, I'm going to uh, ask you some of the questions we saw in the chat. The first question was, what is the top K estimator that we are using in the demo that you showed? So the top K estimator is, is just the same as the string indexer in Spark. But we implement it a little bit differently uh, so that we keep the top K elements on the fly uh, with one pass. So we use the stream live uh, Java algorithm uh, that just go, keeps uh, a 
a data structure of the k most frequent elements on the fly rather than doing a do, computing the whole set of distinct elements or, or rank them rank them all we rank them uh, on the fly Sounds good and another question that we have is a question that we normally get very regularly is the root based predictive engine that you have built um, uh, is that uh, going to be public so we're looking into how the MLDB, uh, sorry, DBML local um, library is de developing. Uh, we can either contribute to that or 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 set our or open our our framework to it's it's really to see how things are evolving. Um, we to to the last time I heard the DBML local implemented the logistic regression but there were plans to adding more algorithms uh, maybe someone from the DataWorks community can, can comment on that uh, later on but uh, yeah that that's that's the answer basically we'll, we're we're either replacing our framework with a DBML uh, local or we just open up our our framework depending on how things evolve. Sounds good. The, another question which probably I, I know the answer to, but Maximo can answer it best, is uh, do you know how, uh, are we still using Hadoop and Spark in our system, or just Spark and S3? So we, we're still using Hadoop. Uh, our old legacy uh, system just uses Hadoop, and we have a parallel new system that just uses Spark and S3 and, and other AWS uh, services. But uh, the idea is to completely replace, at some point in the year, uh, just turn the switch off for Hadoop and just use Spark. But at the meantime, we're running in parallel with both systems. Sounds good. Um, uh, the next question was, what is the percentage of accuracy that we consider as a good accuracy? And this is a very interesting question, like because, uh, because we work in a very uh, imbalanced data set, the accu uh, like uh, having enough positives in the holdout data set is pretty important to us, right? Uh, so I think the best accuracy that we consider right now is more than I think 55 percent. But we have we have a caveat. So what we do is we always look at the confidence in the accuracy that we generate based on the number of positives that were used to generate that accuracy. And if the confidence is uh, if the low, and we always look at the lower bound of the accuracy. So only if we are confident in the accuracy of the classifier based on the positives that we are using to generate the accuracy, only then we use that number, else we just ship a generic model. Uh, the next question is, is there any time frame that indicates when the model needs to, uh, to be updated? And frankly, it's a very interesting question. We don't know right now what the time frame that needs to be, uh, that uh, we need to wait to generate a model. So we generate a new model every day, and sometimes it's wasteful because it would have been the same if we would have used the model from yesterday. But we don't want to take that chance because, as I said, that sometimes the advertisers release like a new product or a new offer, and that completely changes the way people are interacting with the ads. So it's better for us to keep on refreshing the models every day than waiting for like coming up with the best uh, time frame. Uh, I think this question is for you, Maximo. How do you distribute data so the computing is faster? Yes, uh, so I did talk about this, but one of the problems we have is that advertiser campaigns can be on, on uh, can be from different sizes. Like we can have a huge campaign that runs to tons of data, and we might have lots of small campaigns uh, that, that that mean less less data. So obviously. Uh, what, 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 if we want to build different data sets, we, we, we will face the fat reducers issue in which if we just do something like reduce by or group by campaign, we're going to have a few executors running most of the data. So what we do is we prepare the data in a way so that each partition, each Spark partition uh, that we write to is a, about the same size. And some some campaigns might have more than one partition, and some campaigns might have only just just one partition. And we do this with a two-pass algorithm. The first the first pass, we just compute the relative sizes of each of the partitions, and in a in a second pass, what we, what we actually do is we assign more uh, sub partitions, which which we call shards, 
to each of those large partitions to even even them up. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Sounds good. So I, I think we are running out of time. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone who attended the webinar. Uh, really, thanks for the questions. They were really cool. And um, yeah, if you have any more questions, just reach out to us uh, maybe on LinkedIn or Twitter, and we would be happy to take your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone uh, again for attending. Please don't forget to rate today's webinar. It's very helpful for us at Databricks to understand what topics are interesting and, and in turn that informs uh, future webinar topics that we're going to put on for you guys. Uh, and again, this webinar was recorded and will be available for replay on databricks.com. So uh, check it out uh, in the next day or two and you'll, you'll be able to rewatch the webinar. Thanks again and have a great day.